be the, our speaker this time. So let me introduce him. Um, he has been working with the PFM, Philippine Frontier Mission, for 21 years. And uh, he said, if you want to know more about him, you may ask after he speaks. So our speaker this uh, afternoon is uh, Dr. Abner Dizon. But before that, let us um, all stand first uh, for a word of prayer. God in heaven, we would like to say thank you so much for this opportunity that you have given us once more to know more about you. Continue to teach us, O oh Lord, and that as we grow more of knowledge about you, may we also grow our love towards you. Please be with us, O oh Father, as we start our ninth plenary session this time. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So without much further ado, let us uh, give the time to Dr. Dizan. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, one of the biggest tests of discipleship in the Adventist Church is the afternoon meeting during <laughs> Sabbath. So uh, you are the true disciples uh, because you're still here. Okay, anyway, uh, like I said this morning, those who want to see the presentation can download it or something. Uh, but for you, you are more blessed because you can ask questions. All right, so the topic for me uh, that I will be speaking on is discipleship in Asia, two parts. One is, what are the challenges to uh, reaching uh, the Asians? And the other one is, what are the common denominators in terms of uh, successful uh, mission and discipleship in Asia? Now, when I think of Asia, sometimes I only think of, of, uh, of Southeast Asia. But actually, Asia is much, much bigger than that. And uh, we'll see in the map, the Asian continent. Uh, it includes China, Russia, and the, even the Middle East. In, in fact, the word East means Asia, okay? So the Asian continent uh, only has 23% or less than one-fourth of the world's surface area, and yet, uh, six out of ten persons in the world live in this continent. So um, there are six Asian for every four non-Asian in the world. Okay? Um, it is also the birthplace uh, and the home of main, many of the major world religions. In fact, all of the major world religion was born in Asia. Uh, that includes Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, and Judaism. Now, the thousands of ethno-linguistic and cultural religious groups in Asia make it a very diverse region. Uh, Asia is not just one world. It is actually many worlds, uh, sometimes intersecting, sometimes colliding, sometimes merging into each other. And uh, here in IS, you have those uh, factors, except that we're trying to minimize the differences. Uh, but beyond, uh, you will see all of this different worlds. As you can see, different colors and all of that. Uh, that's Asia. Now, as such, Asia presents a wide range of challenges for mission and uh, the discipleship. Uh, interestingly enough, in spite of the fact that Christianity, to most Asians, was and still considered, is still is considered a foreign religion, and yet Christianity is growing in Asia. Okay. Uh, this paper will identify the challenges and common denominators to mission, meaning outreach, as well as discipleship or enrich in Asia. Okay. So the first part is what are the challenges uh, when it comes to trying to reach Asians? Okay. The first one is what we call revivalism and pluralism. Now, what does that mean? Well, it used to be that mission leaders were thinking that the world religions such as Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism will collapse and disappear under the impact of Christian mission and the process of westernization. Because, by the way, westernization is the, the biggest export of the West, I mean, culture. 
And so they're saying, with all of this Western station coming in, these religions in the different parts of Asia are going to collapse. However, that did not happen because contrary to that, to that uh, thinking, the response to modernization and westernization in many parts of Asia was to have a revival in traditional religion. And also, uh, of course, there was the economic strength and political power that came in. Um, religious revivalism resulted in a highly sensitive atmosphere of religious intolerance. So revivalism on the one hand, and then there's intolerance. At the same time, there is also extreme pluralism. In some countries where uh, there's a lot of different religious groups, uh, they, they want to live with each other. For instance, Indonesia is one example. They have this, uh, what, what ideology was that? With the, uh, like uh, there are seven, uh, that where all the different religions can work together and live together, that was Pancasila. 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 Okay, <laughs> and so there is that extreme, extreme um, pluralism. It used to be that Islam in Indonesia was a moderate face of Islam. Unfortunately, nowadays it is becoming more and more fundamental, uh, fundamentalist. So, on the one hand, there is the religious revivalism which leads to intolerance. And then on the other side, you have extreme pluralism where they say, your religion is as good as mine, and uh, we should, instead of trying to change each other's religion, let's just work together. All right. Ethnic identity determines religion, okay? Uh, so that sometimes in Thailand, to be Thai means to be Buddhist, or to be Malay means to be a Muslim, okay? Uh, if a Malay decided to convert to another religion, that person would lose his or her ethnic identity as well as social, political, and economic privileges. Uh, I heard that in some countries, uh, you have to have an ID that shows what your religion is. And so when you change your religion, many of the uh, economic uh, privileges also goes away with it. So some, in some places, they don't officially change their religion because otherwise they lose their identity and all of these things. Okay, the second hindrance is uh, modernization and materialism. Now, uh, this is not just a Western phenomenon. Westernization and modernization is a global phenomenon nowadays. So much so that one, one professor was saying, whenever you go to one city after another, even though it's a different country, it almost looks the same. Uh, I, I've been to Dubai, I have been to uh, Thai, uh, Bangkok, I have been to Beijing, and it's, it's almost like when you've been to one, one city, you've been to all of them. It's almost the same. So it, modernization is a global phenomenon. Different Asian societies are, are at different stages in the continuum of modernization. Now, when we say modernization, the definition is it is a commitment to transforming economy with the use of technology. Um, and there are, uh, what, what happens is that widely discrepant meanings and meaning systems and the plurality of social life worlds are integrated in one overarching and comprehensive worldview. Modern people find it difficult, well, they don't find it difficult, they actually merge all of their traditional beliefs as well as modern uh, beliefs and mix it together without them realizing that these are actually uh, contradictory to each other. Now, there is a, uh, the effect of modernization. The effect of modernization is materialism. Now, somebody said materialism is spending money you don't have on things that you don't need uh, to impress people that you don't care about. <laughs> so, uh, what are the effects of modernization? Well, secularization. Um, and then the partner of secularization is materialism. Uh, this is one of the greatest dangers to spiritual vitality. Uh, in fact, they said materialism effectively saps the life out of Christianity as well as other world religion. And so in Islam, I, I'm, I've been studying Islam for a while, uh, one of the things that they are trying to fight is modernization and secularization. In the Middle East, there are countries where they, not, they do not want any of the comforts of the West. Uh, Muscat, Oman was one of those countries. It was only within the last 40 years that they, were, they allowed roads to be built 
and they allowed cars and all of this uh, other modern comforts to come in because they realized, and that is a correct realization, technology and all of these uh, things from uh, modern things is a Western, uh, let's say, has a Western uh, flavor in it, and it tends to secularize the people. Um, now, there is, a, um, there is a sociologist named Peter Berger, and he, he uh, had the secularization thesis. Now, this is not always true, but his thesis is modernization will eventually result in relativizing all perspective. It will make everything relative. I mean, the, the truth becomes relative, especially in the religious perspective. For instance, for the Buddhists, his truth is truth in the Buddhist context. For the Muslims, their truth is truth in their context. For Christian, our truth is truth in our context. So they, they, the modernization says, let's live with each truth because all, all road leads to Rome, so to speak. Uh, and therefore, as a result of secularization, they said there will be a privatization of religious beliefs. It's a private thing. It's no longer a corporate thing. Uh, and then also, there is a pluralization of ideology. So you can both be a Seventh-day Adventist, and yet you have a postmodern uh, thinking, and yet you have so and so forth. So uh, there is a pluralization of ideologies and worldview. The third hindrance is racism, prejudice, and suspicion. Now, racism is based on a lack of understanding. Somebody says, you, you fear what you don't understand. Because it's difficult to understand. For instance, I was, I was uh, uh, looking for funeral, uh, funeral rites, and I saw that in some parts of China, like Tibet, they have what we call the sky burial. And what, what it means is uh, they would bring out the dead body and allow the vultures to come and eat the, the flesh after all, uh, the flesh has been eaten, they would pound the, uh, what do you call it, the bones and merge it with some other food and then call the, the uh, vultures again to finish up. So you are buried in the sky. Uh, and for people who don't understand that, why they are doing that, we either hate them or we fear them. What they, um, so because there's so much culture, so much different cultures in Asia, there is a lot of uh, racial prejudice. With the thousands of languages, cultures, ethnicity, and religion, the result is fear, prejudice, and suspicion between various cultural religious groups. And um, this, there are serious barriers for someone. Sometimes it's even easier for an American to come and reach some of the Asians than for their Asian neighbors to reach them because of this racial uh, barrier and discrimination. Um, also, as a subset of this obstacle, there is restriction placed on direct evangelism. Um, interestingly, there are countries where they do not allow foreigners to evangelize. They would just allow locals to do evangelism. Now, the problem is the locals can only evangelize those in their city. They cannot go to the other cities or other places. So it hinders discipleship and reaching out in church planting. In East Asia alone, more than half of the 17 countries, uh, especially in East Asia, uh, are close to missionaries. That is called what, what they call it now, close countries or restricted access countries. And that's where we need to learn how to enter and, and reach out, uh, out to them. The other barrier is called nominalism and Christopaganism. That simply means uh, that they, there are many Christians in name in Asia, just in name, uh, but they have not experienced true heart conversion. That's what we were talking about this morning. True discipleship in, should start from the heart. But many Christians were born in a Christian family or it's a cultural name. Uh, some countries, they would kill for, their, uh, for the name of their religion. Uh, not because they believe in the religion, but because it's a cultural identity. Also, there are Christians in Asia, many Christians in Asia, who continue with pre-Christian practices, animistic practices, uh, because uh, 
it has not been touched. And so those who are doing applied theology need to study how do you change the worldview. Okay? It is misleading to portray nominal and syncretistic Christians as already evangelized. Um, and then the other one is religious intolerance. You know where this is? Yeah. Um, relating to people of other religions has always been a long-standing issue in Asia. How do you deal with people of another culture, another religion? Uh, and there is a tendency, because of the revivalism of ethnic religion, there is also a revivalism of ethnic violence, like Ambon, uh, all of this. They are divided along religious lines. Nowadays, it used to be that you are divided between the East and the West, or between America and Russia. Nowadays, it's no longer that. The issue is about religion. You see IS, the... Uh, Islamic State, ISIS, they call it ISIS, Islamic State of Iraq and uh, Syria. That's a religious uh, issue. The terrorism that was done in, in America in, two, in uh, when was that, 2001? That was a religious, religious thing. So it's, people are now becoming divided along religious lines, uh, no longer just among, around the political lines. Religious intolerance. Some modern thinkers see the old battle lines of the Cold War replaced by new ones shaped by religious forces and ideologies. In spite of the amazing growth of the church in Asia, the price for demonstrating faith in Jesus can be very high because Christians are often harassed, arrested, and even killed. And that's why I told you this morning, we need to, uh, our members and those who are, we are reaching out to need to realize that there is a cost to discipleship. Because the real thing is that in Asia, many countries, if you become a Christian, you will experience a, a lot of suffering. In spite of all of this, the growth of Christianity in Asia is very fast. Um, in fact, the growth of Christianity in this region is remarkable, especially in what we call unreached or unevangelized areas such as China, India, Nepal, Iran, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and North Korea, okay? Now, the question is, what do people use to be able to reach them? What are the, some of the common denominators? How is it that in spite of all of these hindrances, they are able to establish churches and to have converts in those places? I would like to know. Now, take note that not everything that works is biblical, okay? There is a, uh, sometimes there's a concept, if we get a lot of members and converts, then that's how we should do it. No. But I'm sharing with you uh, the common denominators that different mission agencies, different churches in Asia are using. Now it's up to you to evaluate whether these are, com these are compatible with Seventh-day Adventist biblical uh, standpoint. Okay. Christianity is the pa fastest growing religion in Asia. It is also growing faster than in any other continent. In fact, Christianity has grown quickly and broadly, expanding to new places where followers of Jesus were few or none until recently. Okay, now, did you know, or maybe fill in the blanks, okay? Those who are still awake, okay? <laughs> fill in the blanks. 83% of non-Christians in the world are... What? 83% are? Well, yes, Asian. That's a lot of non-Christians in the world, huh? 83% are Asian. 87% of the unevangelized in the world are? Asian. The least evangelized peoples on earth are predominantly? Wow, you don't have to think, huh? <laughs> because this is about Asia. So, yes, there's a big challenge. Asia has the fastest growing churches. It's also the least evangelized people are found in Asia. I like being in Asia, don't you? Because we have the challenge to penetrate the places, the people that have never heard the gospel. Amen? It's exciting to be alive today. Especially uh, next, uh, during the GC, they will talk about reaching the unentered or unreached cities in the world. 
And so you have the opportunity to try to apply some of these things, uh, some of the common denominators that are being used uh, by non-Adventists, of course. Uh, but I hope these are... So effective evangelists, uh, uh, disciples are needed in Asia. Okay. What are the common denominators in discipling people in Asia? Number one. Oh, well, here's another information. Let me just go. Okay. Holism uh, and or holistic ministry. Now, when I say holism, we refer to the partnership of social action with evangelism. That means we're not just dealing with their spiritual needs. We're also dealing with their physical uh, needs. It's, it stresses service and solidarity with the poor. Remember, there's a lot of poor in Asia. Now, even though I said don't preach a uh, prosperity gospel, we still have to deal with the poverty. Somebody said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. While it's very important that we are aware of the danger of dull out mentality, uh, of dependency, we need to be Christians who share the love of Christ to others. And so holistic ministry has been used in Asia with a lot of success. Uh, it is an attempt to make the gospel good news to the poor. Um, and so they use different social ministries, and I'm not going to read through that. Also, it's about offering pe people an answer to their questions. And not just the questions of uh, spiritual things. Uh, it's not just about eternal questions. Many of us, when we have 28 fundamental beliefs, we're dealing with eternal questions. But we're not dealing with questions like, uh, who will I marry in Asia they have a way to know who they will marry. They will get together with a shaman and will get maybe some, some uh, chicken and look whether they say, is this the woman that I should marry? If the, if the liver turns to the left, yes. If the liver goes to the right, no. So if they become Seventh-day Adventist, how will you answer that question? Many of us don't even know how to answer the question, what is God's will for me? What course should I take? Well, whether I should be a missionary or not? So if you get converts coming in from a culture where there's a way for them to answer their questions like that, then it's not going to work out well for them. Or uh, where can they bury the dead? Interestingly, death and uh, death right, rites rituals are very serious issues for Buddhists and for those in the Chinese religious background. Uh, and the relationship with ancestors, for instance, in China, uh, this is a, an issue that Adventist Church needs to deal with. Also, um, what are the appropriate Christian behavior at certain things? Number two is spiritual warfare and power evangelism. Uh, encounters with witchcraft, spiritism, and demon possession make it difficult for missionaries, particularly those from the Western educated uh, uh, area, to deny the realities of Asian spirit world. Unfortunately, as I said before when I did the presentation on demon possession, Many of uh, those who have been trained in seminaries are trained from a Western perspective where they're, they're, they don't deal with the spirit world. Now, one of the fastest growing denominations in the world, not, uh, uh, groups of Protestants, are the Pentecostals. And the Pentecostals are even able to get converts from Muslims. You know what is their main approach? Power evangelism, miracles, signs and wonders praying for the sick, casting out evil spirit, and they are doing it. Now, some of us say, uh, they can do that. They don't have the truth. Uh, we, we have the truth, but we cannot do that. So uh, I, I wonder, if you are looking, if, somebody, if you're selling the gospel, and the ones who are going to buy it are there, and you say, we have the truth, but we don't have the power. They have the power, but they don't have the truth. Which do you think they will choose? So, um, just something to think about. Now, in Asia, the underlying religiosity is animism. Belief in the spirit world. Now, I will not ask you for a show of hands. But many of us, even though we're very much educated, when there's something that happens to us and we cannot explain it, the next explanation is, there must be some spirits. There must be something like this. Okay? So, uh, spiritual warfare and power evangelism has been very successful in uh, discipleship in Asia, from the other denominations, that is. In Asia, it is crucial to have a visible, practical demonstration that Jesus is more powerful 
than the gods, the local gods. The ones that they worship or the ones that they fear. It is not enough to speak of a Christ who has power to save from sin. We need to demonstrate that He really has the power. Don't just say, oh, Jesus can heal you. Read the, the Gospels. We need to know how to pray for the sick. We need to, uh, we need to know how to deal with the demon possessed. Don't just say, oh, somebody's demon possessed. Let's go and ask for the pastor in Manila. No, we need to be ready for this. Number three is what they call liberationism and social advocacy. Uh, now, liberationism is a bad word for many, uh, for, for many Adventists, especially in South America. Uh, but there is a, a, a measure of a need for this. Holism uh, has its basis on a concern for the poor. Uh, liberalism, uh, rib, libera, liberationism also has a, a concern for the poor. It is equating salvation from sin with the struggle of the poor and the oppressed people for justice. When ministering to a politically and economically oppressed society, and there's a lot of that in Asia, you cannot, if you want to be relevant, you cannot avoid talking about the situation. Uh, you need to consider Isaiah 58. The gospel as a liberating force is indeed attractive to the oppressed people. Now, number four approach that are being used, or denominators that are being used, is incarnationalism. Now, this means uh, there is an emphasis on continuing the mission of Christ on earth. Whatever Jesus did when, while he was here, I will incarnate it. I will do it in the same way that Jesus did his ministry on earth. Uh, that means living out the life and ministry of Jesus in the community. Uh, this is the powerful, the, uh, there is the powerful witness of a transformed life. Many converts in Asia are able to reach others because the people see they are transformed. And that's incarnational ministry, uh, which reinforces the message. There, there needs to be a willingness to live in relationship, establishing a physical, emotional, and spiritual presence that requires constancy and predictability. One of the, one of the problems of uh, when the missionaries come from another country and you're trying to reach people in that country with political problems, when there is civil war, the first thing that happens is the foreigners go out and the people suffer without their leaders and their teachers. Incarnational ministry says you have to stay with them. Whatever they are suffering, you have to suffer. And some of the missionaries that I've read about uh, who did not leave when the country was in upheaval, they were able, when, when the civil war went away, they were able to get a lot of people to join their church. They say, this is like Jesus. These, these are our leaders. They will not leave us. They will be with us. They will die with us. And so on and so forth. So, incarnational ministry. And then another, another approach that is very effective. And um, if, if you want to know more about this, we have an organization called Philippine Frontier Missions. The approach they're using in evangelism is called Bible storying approach. And um, let, me, let me share with you. In a traditionally oral society, storytelling as a teaching method is very appropriate. Uh, Asia has always been a, uh, in the past, have been an, an oral society. Okay? They like to tell stories. In fact, evangelism here works with a lot of stories. The verses in the Bible, very few. But the stories, there are more. Okay? And, uh, and so because people remember the stories. They don't remember the text. They remember the stories. And so this approach, missionaries in Asia have successfully used the Bible storying approach to present the gospel to Asians. Now, what is this? Uh, they, by the way, they call it the chronological Bible study method. What they do is they follow the progress of biblical revelation uh, from creation in Genesis until Christ in the Gospels and then from the church, how the church was established in Acts and the Epistles and then on to the end of days through Revelation. It's like giving a uh, whole story from Genesis unto uh, Revelation. This has proven to be very effective in getting people to understand why Jesus had to come on earth to die. So, uh, Philippine Frontier Missions have been using this as our approach to reach pagan tribes and Muslim tribes with some, uh, with some uh, success. The sixth 
approach is whole family evangelism. Okay, now some people don't like motorcycles because there's only a few that can ride. But in Mindanao, everybody, the whole family can ride in the motorcycle. Okay, uh, if you want, uh, Pastor, we can, we can go there some other time. Okay, they call this the Habal Habal. Or some, some people call it Skylab. Uh, Pastor Augustine, I'm sure, I'm sure you have written on this, uh, on one of this. The family orientation of Asians make it undesirable to extract individuals. Remember what we do in evangelism. We say, how many of you want to, be, uh, to accept Jesus? And so one person, one person, one person. This is a Western model. This is an individualistic model. Now in Asia, even though it's working, in Asia, the more appropriate one and, and desirable one is not to extract them from their family. Instead, to include the entire family. Uh, in many cases, extraction evangelism has caused a community to be prejudiced to the gospel, not because of the message of the gospel, but because those converts are seen as someone who is going against the, uh, the um, cooperation and the respect of the people. They, they feel these are anarchists. They, are, they come in before we had cooperation. Now when they come, they don't join us anymore. So uh, uh, it's not a very good thing. Inviting the entire family to receive the gospel and aiming at whole groups rather than mean in, mere individuals, especially effective in societies that are family-based uh, such as Korea and China. Some Muslim countries or Muslim cities or towns, uh, this is also a, a very good approach. What they do is sometimes they, they deal with the leaders. They deal with the head of the family, not with the individuals, not with the children. Sometimes we, we do like a vacation Bible school and then we have the children and then sometimes we are tempted to, to give Bible study to the children. Uh, for some countries, this is not very appropriate. What you do is you get the parents, even if the children are attending, you ask permission from the parents so that they do not see that you're a, uh, you are a competition uh, to their family. The other one is contextualization. We've heard a lot of this about, uh, recently. Now, contextualization has been used. That means they, they enculturate the faith. It's an attempt to share the gospel by putting on Asian clothes. Uh, I remember we went to an, an Aita village and uh, the, uh, the, one of the chieftains said, we were using the picture all, and he said, Oh, that means we Aitas, they are dark skinned and very small and curly haired. And he said, We Aitas, we are no good because we are not really part of the human family. And he said, And we say, Why? Because everything you teach are from the white people. And we see the pictures. And he said, Next time we will put uh, Africans there. So that, uh, but the point is, the, the gospel needs to take on the, uh, the look and the feel of the, the local culture. So, Things like redemptive analogies, things like contextual theologies, things like indigenous music and art and architecture, we can use them. Now I realize this can be controversial in some, in some places, but you don't have to be an American Christian to be a Christian. You can be a Russian Christian, you can be a Chinese Christian, you can be an Indian Christian with the culture as long as that, that culture doesn't go against the gospel. Contextualization. And then number eight is church planting. Wherever church planting is done, uh, wherever the gospel is growing remarkably, there is an em emphasis in planting and establishing local congregations. Now, many times what we do is we do evangelism in one place and then we leave. This is not what they are doing. What they are doing is when they do evangelism anywhere, they don't leave until a congregation is established there. Even if the congregation is just 10 or, or 12 persons and they make sure they're not even thinking of the church building, they're thinking of the... By the way, the church is not a building. Although nowadays we say, let's go to church. Okay? The church is not a building. In the Bible, there is no uh, definition of the church as a building. It's a people, a group of people. So the gospel mandate is not just preaching the gospel, it's also making disciples and gathering them into communities. And therefore we see in Paul that he did not just preach, he organized congregations. Uh, I think this is the last slide. Discipleship, real discipleship, produces growth. And growth produces propagation. The growth of the church in Asia is especially dependent on discipleship. 
Discipleship leads to propagation because a church that does not propagate itself will soon die out. That's the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dizon, for that uh, very enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, this time, we uh, would like to accept your questions. If you have some questions that you'd like to ask the speaker. Anyone? Yes, Dr. Prima. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abner, for your presentation. Um, this, I have been bothered by an issue from yesterday onwards, and uh, you have confirmed my trouble. <laughs> um, and uh, today you pointed out one of the ways to disciple us being the whole family evangelism. I, I like that a lot. Uh, the holistic way. And yesterday we heard a presentation on family-like, uh, family-like discipleship or something in Korea. And you just mentioned that in certain countries in Asia, that's approach. But I'm still concerned about the appeal towards genders, okay? Men are primarily the sources of help. You can see the picture right there. It doesn't appeal to me at all over there, you know, um, Jesus inviting disciples is all men. What about women? What about children? We, we need something appealing. And uh, when family orientation is a thrust, how will we appeal to women? How will we appeal to children when only men may be up in the front? What are our, our plans to train women, okay, who can appeal to children for sure more than men? Uh, are there plans? Okay. Yes. Well, in a way, I'm, I'm glad that I'm in the Philippines because in some parts of the world, this issue can be very divisive. Um, recently, the General Conference Women's Ministry Department has commissioned myself and my wife to write a manual to train women to reach out to Muslim women. Uh, and I'm sure they also have other uh, manuals that helps the women in the churches uh, to reach out. Although there are countries, they said that it's, they have to step uh, lightly because some countries, they say, if there's evangelism and the women is up there, they say, no, 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 we don't want the women up there, go down. Uh, what can we do? Definitely more than 50% of the membership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are women. Did you know that? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, many of, those, many of those in leadership are men. And so uh, there's this, uh, let's say, imbalance. But women in many countries where I visited were some of the most active in ministry. Uh, whether they are recognized or not, they do it because they are disciples of Jesus. By the way, in the Gospels, we find many women have been part of the traveling seminary of Jesus. And uh, I would like to uh, let you know that uh, Jesus is not androcentric. He is not uh, just, he's not patriarchal. Uh, he, he, he sees women and men as equal uh, in, in God's sight. But we have to deal with culture. And uh, as much as, for instance, from my side, um, I did not realize that men and women are so, uh, needs to be very, uh, I mean, the hierarchical thing like that. But until I, I listen to some of the pastors uh, share about their views about women, and I realize there's parts of the world where the culture is such that uh, Paul's uh, epistles about women shutting up is very well used, okay? What can we do? Number one, we need to educate. Uh, here in IS, one of the things that we will be doing 
is the Mission Emphasis Week. Dr. Gaptil said, we want to see more of these pastors and uh, uh, people here in IS to be the first ones to be culturally sensitive and open, to be the first ones to understand that in Christ we can be equal, the men and the women, the children and, and the men. There are positions in terms of uh, the gifts and in terms of uh, uh, what is culturally appropriate, but we need to be more open. The goal of the church of discipleship is being to edify us into the matureness of, our fa of, of faith and knowledge in Christ. Now, some people are higher in terms of what they have understood, like countries where they have, for instance, Indonesia and Philippines, we had, we had elected Filipino and Indonesian president. So you can see that in this country, it's not a big deal if the leader is a woman compared to some other countries. But some cultures are still struggling with some of the basics of, uh, of dealing with the gender issues. So education is number one, I think. Number two, I think they need to get to know more of some of the stories of women whom God had used. Actually, number one, we should have showed them about Ellen White. I mean, uh, so, uh, but again, I hope it will not be a divisive thing in, in cultures where um, it's patriarchal, then maybe God will uh, allow them to remain like that. Because by the way, the Bible was born in a patriarchal culture, uh, and so it's, it was speaking with that, with that worldview, and God deals with each culture at the level that we are in. But his goal is for us to eventually move up to, let's say, the heavenly culture or the Edenic culture. Uh, and in, as far as the relationship and the families are concerned, then um, hopefully, um, before Jesus comes, uh, we will reach maturity in that aspect. Any other question? No more? If none, then may we call on Dr. Oh, Pastor Liang to present the certificate. On behalf of the IS Asian Theological Society, I would like to present the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Abner Tizong for his uh, valuable presentation on the title of the challenges and common denominators in mission and discipleship in Asia during the third IS Asian Theological Society annual forum. Thank you so much. And this is the token uh, of appreciation. Thank you so much. <laughs>